Good morning, and welcome to the Buna Fight Experience podcast. I am your host, Kyle, but really, people just call me Buna. This is a business podcast with a hyper focus on esports and the creator economy. If you're new here or returning and haven't done so already, please consider following and or subscribing to your favorite platform of choice, and be sure to turn those post notifications on or the little bell. That way you're notified every time a new episode is dropped. Y'all, as mentioned in some of the previous intros to some of the earlier episodes, we had some exciting new announcements in May, except they were in April because I just couldn't wait to pull the trigger. We're on two new platforms, one of which is a completely custom website done by me and the friends at PodPage. Um, shout out to them. I will include the link below if you're a podcaster looking to build a website. It's incredibly easy. It links to all of your hosting platforms and their UI is just incredibly beautiful. We have everything housed from previous episodes. That includes audio, video, transcripts, guest profiles, even a mailing list. Um, guys, there's just no shortage of content here. And if you're on YouTube and you're watching this right now, you, well, you would be since you're right now. I, okay. Uh, you will see that I have one of my Bonafide Gaming t-shirts on. This is my merch store, which can be accessed through the website. All of the designs on these shirts, mugs, hoodies, leggings, Everything in between is done my, done by my designer. He's been with me for the past three to four years, has done everything from my uh, gaming brand to my podcasting brand to merchandise. He's a flawless designer, and I consider him a great friend of mine. His name is Art by Saint. If you're looking to get any graphics done, um, I will put his information down below as well. Second piece. That's just one. That's just one. Second piece. We are we are launched we launched a brand new Patreon page to provide exclusive access and benefits that only are that only are available to my Patreons. This has everything from wallpapers to early access to episodes to knowing who my guests are weeks in advance to even asking my guests a question. And y'all, if you're a VIP member for three months in a row on my Patreon, you will get access to something that I don't even have in house yet, and that is an exclusive Bonafide Gaming T-shirt which you can only get by being a VIP subscriber for three months in a row. I know that's a lot to take in. The website is www.bonafide.com and the Patreon is patreon.com forward slash bonafide XP. But if you're here for the podcast, I'm going to, I'm not going to expect you to remember that. So we'll go ahead and put all of those links down in the descriptions below. And with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the show. Good afternoon, Adam. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm almost done on my work day, where I know most like Americans are just starting yeah. now. So I'm I'm very much warmed up. I, I've been ranting and, and raving on on written words, so I'm happy to be able to do that <laughs> via spoken word now. I like it. Yeah, yeah. We're just uh, I'm on my second cup of coffee, so you know we're we're just kind of getting we're just kind of getting started here. But happy to happy to be here. It's you know. These platforms are really cool, man. And I like COVID in a weird way has been kind of a cool blessing to where like these platforms that allow remote podcasting to happen, like have like really flourished because, you know, before this, this conversation, you're, you know, you're, you're across the pond and I'm in Texas. You know what I mean? Um, this would have mm. not been possible. So no, no. And I mean, I mean like esports has had like talking head web webcam videos and podcasts yeah. and stuff for quite a while, yeah. a while of course, but like watching, like daytime television, like news, I don't have a television, but like seeing like news platforms and programs trying to adapt to how we do things, even even just basic stuff like this. And, and obviously in like sports and, and such as well, like it's been really interesting because it's kind of made me think, oh, look, we've been doing this for years at like right. a high quality and, and, right. and some somewhat you'd imagine like legacy media who have years of experience and all the money and equipment in the world are absolutely shite so yeah. like it just reminds me like oh we're, we're not doing too bad overall you know and yeah like obviously what we're using our riverside is something i've been looking into uh zoom uh i am sick of seeing zoom to be honest with you <laughs> yeah. like yeah. the amount of calls both like professionally and personally yeah. that's the thing it's like both my friends and my <laughs> colleagues want to use it you know yeah. so yeah it's it's a bit tiresome in a sense like having to look at screens all the time but I, I think like we've never had more time than we have right now especially like in the past year to like go out for walks and stuff right so yeah. i mean there's also the, there's a remedy for that stuff and hopefully um we can kind of get back to some sort of normality soon i don't think i'll be going to many esports conferences and stuff anymore because yeah. like a, a lot of the value can be can be gained online by just a twitter dm or something you know right but yeah I, i'm definitely definitely grateful that 
we've kind of mastered the art of what we do in our industry. Yeah. So it's, it's been a pretty seamless transition in, on that front. And yeah, it helps you obviously keep in touch with people and meet new people. Yeah. So uh, yeah. very lucky in that sense. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and we'll, we'll dive into it earlier, but you made a tweet about that. Like, it's like, you know, like these, these esports conferences and like these marketing conferences are, are, are absolutely not needed because we have access to people at the top, you know, like right here and mm-hmm. right now, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, well, I, I, so I, I worked for esports insider and they're a news publication which actually makes money via events, right? Yeah. And, and these events were uh, conferences. So I've been to London a couple of times and, and New York with them. And there was supposed to be like Manila and Stockholm that obviously got canceled because yeah. of what's gone on. But look, well, I was working them, so I wasn't necessarily networking all the time anyway. When I say working them, I was just writing a bit, written bits and bobs and just mincing around really, mm-hmm. doing odd jobs. But like now I, I, I don't really see the purpose. It's good to have a chin wag and just catch up with old friends and such right but i mean i don't think that's worth the 300 quid ticket or whatever yeah. it is and all the travel costs and stuff right and then they pivoted to online events and i'm not French yet i love sam and the people there but it's just it's literally just like scheduled zoom calls yeah. with people at the top it's just like I've, once you've seen it once you've kind of seen it 50 times at this yeah. point right and it's it's also now i'd rather watch specialized conversations like on demand whenever the hell i want so sure. like a youtube channel is much better to me if someone um, say I, I decide to interview all the, the CEOs and C-level C executives and such at all the, the major companies, that's going to be more worthwhile, in my opinion, at least, than, oh, okay, next next month at this time, you have to tune in and they may get to your question, they may not, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. You know, like, the level of ac- accessibility in our industry, considering there's um, so many different social platforms and, and everyone's yeah. <laughs> like jumping on a stream now, you know, it's, yeah. it's so high, it's just like, I'm, not, I'm never going to pay uh, to attend one of these conferences. No. I, re- I really don't need to. No. Like networking has never been easier. Yeah, it, it really has. And, and, and I kind of stumbled my way into this like podcast and like, and, and I, I kind of stumbled into like what networking really was, you know, and I'd never done it before. And so I said, this is, this mm-hmm. is way better. Um, and I mean, to, to what you're talking about, like with YouTube and podcasts, like I've gained more, you know, like I'm about like halfway through university and I'm not sure if I'm even going to finish because I've gained more. Okay knowledge and more insight from listening to podcasts and YouTube videos from people who have done it. And they, they give me exactly what I need to hear. And I don't need to sit through a lecture where five minutes of it I'm interested in and 95 minutes. I just have to be there. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like it, it, yeah, yeah, it's exactly the same as books. Like it distills knowledge passed on from fucking decades upon decades. Yeah. And then you can just flick to whichever parts that are applicable to your life or your interests. Right? right. So it's, it's the same kind of thing, like having like the on demand knowledge at any moment. Like it's, it's yeah. insane. So I, I didn't go to university. Like there was, there was no chance I was going to get, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I was like, well, I don't want to get into 27,000 pounds worth of debt. Right, for right, something right. I may not like, you know, and then it eventually came to me later on. Like I never would have guessed that I'd be in journalism, by the way, like not ah. I was decent at like English and writing at school, but like, it was not something I planned to do by any means, you know? So like I, if I went the usual path, um, I'd probably be like a, IT technician or like support staff, sure, uh, sure. Uh, like um, a tech company, a uh, very different path, you know? And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think the accessibility we've got, not only to people, but to knowledge, like distilled knowledge yeah. on demand, whenever the hell we want is, is insane. Right. And um, I don't know. I, I yeah, there, there's some merit to obviously uh, the institutional education and the legacy education sure. stuff, right? There course, is. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, in, in a landscape that's changing all the time. Uh, I, it's, it's not something I find too useful, but I mean, I, I'm not going to go on about eSports certifications and stuff too much unless we want to bring that up. But my God, man, I, I just hope people just don't fall for things just just because they seem good. Yeah. You know? Like just because it's like deemed a natural path. Like m- my parents just fully expected me to go uh, as far as I could in education. Sure. And um, the guy I grew up with, so I'm 26, the guy I grew, I've been out of, out of school for 10 years, mm. now, out of college for eight years. The guy I grew up with living opposite me, best mates from like one years old. He's wow. still at university now, 10, 10 years after I left school, eight years after I left college. He's doing a, a doctorate yeah. in med- medieval English at Oxford University. Like he's gone an entire <laughs> different path to me. Um, yeah. And he's probably going to be studying until he's like 28, 29, maybe 30. Yeah. You know, and then yeah. he's got to try and go out and, and get a job in a highly specialized sector. Whereas right. I've been working for eight years now and I've got all the work experience you need right. and, and all the little bits and bobs that you get from that, you know, so two very different paths and no doubt you'll earn more money than me right. <laughs> eventually. But like, that's a lot of money he has to, he owes back and um, sure. a lot of pressure to find something that's within his field of knowledge then, you know? Exactly. So, yeah. yeah. I don't think he's doing anything wrong. And I, I like, 
look, like, I celebrate what he's doing. It's a massive commitment, and he, obviously he's found what he's interested in. Yeah. But like, it's just not for everyone, you right. know. And, it's it, certainly not for me. And to tell you the truth, though, like any doctor I go see, I'd want them to go have their doc. You know, I'd, I'd want them to like go have their masters. Yes, you yes. know what I mean? Like there, it's not a dead industry, and like I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy you brought that up because it, it's not. It, it's not that it's not needed. It is very well needed. Like my my tax accountant, I I want to know that they've gone to school for it. Like if I hire a lawyer, yes, I want to make yes. sure that they're like know what they're talking about. You know, so it's but for the but for the most like for non specialized industries, like it's we're getting we're in this weird like transition period where it's just it's kind it it can get your foot in the door, but you don't really need to put your foot in the door. You know, like you can open the door yeah. yourself. Like you've been given the keys. Like the internet is kind of like that 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 catalyst. You know, versus. Mm-hmm. If you spend that, you got to spend the time regardless, right? You know, it's just how you want to spend it. And now that you have the choice sure. to spend it, here's how you do spend it. You know, for sure. Like, if you want to get into marketing, like the, the channels change so often, yeah. and like we don't even know the like the algorithms on these platforms anymore. Yeah. So how how the hell are you going to teach that? I don't know. And obviously that will change in a year's time or right. whatever. So I think like going to university for something like marketing, like probably don't make sense. I I'd suggest like getting like the top ten books on Amazon yeah. or or your local bookshop. And um, <clears throat> learning the principles and working out like the, the foundational knowledge from those things, like the human psychology aspect, sure. right? And, yeah. and like the, the set standards that have transcended time as such. And then from there, you can apply that to however uh, it, it tends to take form, like whatever shape or form it, it appears in. But yeah, I, I could have gone the marketing route as well. I had a marketing job at some point and uh, I was kind of thinking about it. I, in fact, the, the company I was working for at the time spent like £2,000 to get me on some diploma. Oh, wow. And I did, I did about a week's worth of it and then stopped and left the job and started to do what I'm doing now, you know, <laughs> which I do apologize to them for, but it just, it just cemented to me. It was like, ah, I don't, I don't need this shit. Like yeah. it just, just having, well, it, obviously, as you say, it depends on what's what, like if you're a doctor, I don't want your level of experience to be like Googling symptoms, right. you know, because I can do that myself. Right. Like you need to have some specialist knowledge there, but yeah, some, some elements, uh, some aspects, some sectors, I think like having the foundational knowledge is enough and then you can adapt that and, and bend it at your will in a sense and, and make stuff happen that way. Yeah. And that, that'll save you an infinite amount of money, time, uh, effort, like the amount of time you'll not waste is insane that you yep. can apply somewhere else. And then like actually applying those foundations, maybe getting them wrong for the first year yeah. is going to be a lot more educational than right. sitting in, in a lecture where 5% of it applies to your interests and needs. You know? Yeah. We, we don't, we don't learn anything by like, we don't learn anything by, by a hundred percent success rate. I mean, like, like I've, I mean, we, nah. we fail a lot more than, than we, than we succeed. And that's like, that's at least the only way I've learned. If someone else has done something different and wants to give me some insight, I'd be happy to, 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 to hear that. But you know, I, I want to uh, want to do a, just a quick, a quick, brief introduction. You know, um, you know, Adam. Like, how did you? You know, who are you? What do you do? How did you stumble into this industry? And just kind of give us like a, a, a quick, a, a, a quick synopsis here. Oh, yeah, sorry, I talk so much. We didn't even get I know, but it's, it's okay. Intro. Uh, <laughs> this is gonna be a good podcast. Yeah, man. So, so I'm a, a journalist. I'm like the only business journalist at Deserto, which gets like eight million reads a month Mm -hmm. (laughs) like a ridiculous amount um i'm called the business content lead but that just means i'm leading the business content but i'm the only one there who does that so whatever it's not impressive whatsoever (laughs) so i'm just i'm just a journalist i'm just a writer occasionally do opinion pieces and stuff but my bread and butter is you know uh speaking to the right people and trying to get the truth out there because there's a lot of smoke and mirrors in the industry Mm -hmm. uh I used to be the editor at Esports Insider, which is a trade like business to business publication. Uh, I look back and I could have done a lot better now, but I needed that experience and this sure. experience to be able to get to that point, right? So, meh, I think I did an okay job. Uh, and before that, I was freelancing uh, across across the board, really, like dabbling in like PUBG and a bit of league writing and stuff, right? But I've never, never really been like a games journalist per se. It's almost. Ex- Besides those odd bits of freelancing, where basically I just needed the money to, sure. to be able to live. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and you know, it's to get your name out there and stuff, right? You you collect like bylines, like it's Pokemon or something. <laughs> uh, just try and get on every site you can, like you've conquered it. Or like Thanos getting the Infinity yeah. Stones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But I I I fell into like journalism, specifically like business journalism, when I decided I'm going to try and get into esports, right? Uh, and this was I think early 2017, like uh, right at the beginning in January. Um, and I, was it 2017? Wow. Or is it 2018? I don't know. I'm getting, I'm getting old. I can't remember. <laughs> like three, three to four years ago. COVID right? didn't I know do you any much. favors. COVID didn't do you any favors. No, not at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not at all, mate. Yeah. And the fact it's like half for my time yeah. now, like I've already <laughs> used all my brain power today. But, um, no, I, I Googled esports news <laughs> yeah. and, and I opened up all of the publications I could find. 
Uh-uh. Emailed all the contacts I could find, so all the press emails yep. or media emails, whatever it may be, contact emails. And one, one or two got back to me. One especially that I remember was Esports Insider. They said we'll give you a two-week trial, uh, and it was basically just once a day I would regurgitate a press release. Mm. You know, yeah, and yeah. I, I didn't actually understand before I started that that it was a business publication, and I didn't understand the ecosystem and the infrastructure around esports by any means. I I got into esports as a fan in like 2008 like in Call of Duty. So I was like playing with Hex and like all the yeah. competitive snipers and then Optic got into game battles and I kind of followed there. Then I was playing uh, Deserto Rules, which is basically like the European MLG. Mm, okay. At the time, this is when Dex- Dexerto had a C instead of an X and it was just a forum. You'd go in and they'd have yeah. their own rule set. You'd, you'd go in and say, looking for a, looking for a scrim, looking for a team. Uh, and, and I just kind of followed it throughout there. Um, and, and that was about it, really. I just played. I tried to go to Milan when I was 14 so I would go pro, but... It was across the country, and my mum wouldn't let me go by myself. I was 14 years old, yeah. good on her. Yeah, yeah. Uh, decent mother. And, you know, uh, it never really went anywhere on that front. I, I watched, I enjoyed, and then I kind of fell out of it a bit, uh, maybe 2015, until I, for whatever reason, decided to play a bit more and then watch again. And then, you know, I, re- I discovered, like, Overwatch League, which was happening at that time. So that was mm, interesting yeah, to watch, yeah. right? And, and then I was aware of Halo. I used to play Halo and stuff. So I just started to discover really how vast esports was and since i've actually realized that esports doesn't exist it is literally just an umbrella term for like maybe 30 40 like sub communities yeah with their own infrastructure own ecosystem own rules own format um everything is different based on each one of these like league of legends or dota uh, somewhat similar in premise sure, right sure, but like sure. the communities there are massively different the way the developers operate within are massively different the amount of money you know what i mean so i didn't realize all of that until i just put in put in the reps yeah yeah basically sure. so so yeah I, I write about like the industry and the business side of things i'm breaking more stories again now i'm back in that game um i have a weekly column where i piss people off a lot <laughs> i see that i follow um, your twitter yeah <laughs> oh i i piss a lot of people off yeah i think my, my two most read uh columns opinion pieces are Esports fans don't exist, and you're not an esports expert. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> which were controversial, but I mean, I, I don't really have anyone who's argued the premise of them. I to try and say I'm wrong, so that's nice. So, so yeah, that that's the over, that's like the most brief version of that I can I can give, and hopefully, I've omitted most of the boring shit. Yeah, yeah, man. I mean, it's 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 funny that you know, like uh, one thing that stuck out to me where we have a very similar kind of childhood, and we're I'm 29, you're 20, so we're we're right around the same and we're in the same, same ballpark yeah. yeah yeah so i mean like i was never you know when we were 13 14 15 years old like that was back when the internet was the culture and the internet was nowhere near what it was a very different time it was mm-hmm. like everyone on the stranger was out to get you everyone was out to like murder you everyone no one could be trusted on the internet like video games are still for basement dwellers you know, i mean we're still kind of sure. in that last part but it's becoming more it's way more accepted now than it was back then but mm-hmm. like you know for, sure. for my parents to like even even three to four hours because i i grew up in uh houston and and esports events were in dallas like they had mlg dallas yeah um and i actually had gotten to play like invited to play as a sub for a halo team you know, which it was, I, I wouldn't no, consider but... myself like, I was like barely an amateur back with, you know, I, I don't want to like tell mm-hmm. myself too much, but um, like I was very, and it was a nobody team, you know, so, uh, but, but it, that's not the point though, but it was like, the point was like that, you know, you're not going to go to uh, uh, play video games with a bunch of strangers you met on the internet. You remember that conversation? Sure. Like how, like just, oh yeah, yeah, all the time, all the time, even if, um, even if I met someone who lived close to me, yeah. uh, say in like a Call of Duty lobby or something, and like we became friends and we were friends for like three or four years, even if it was like an hour train away or something, yeah. like even trying to get permission and, and understanding that they were as much as friends as someone I knew in, right. in real life, right. you used to call it back then, yeah, yeah. even though the internet is still real life yeah. in a sense, you know? But yeah, just, just being able to explain that, look, these internet friends are actually potentially more friendly and more of a friend than some of the people I've got in real life. But right. you can't see that because I've never physically met them, even though I've probably spent more quality time with them yeah. than, than a lot of my real life friends who you know who I've grown up with, you know? So yeah. having that conversation was, eh, I say tough. Like it was, it was tough. Like the conversation was fine, but like trying to convince them otherwise yeah. was, was the tough part, right? So you just kind of kind of concede it. And I wonder where all of my Xbox and PlayStation friends are now. Yeah, you know, yeah. Like all these potential lost friendships. So, you know, the funny <laughs> thing is, man, like most of mine have, have have disappeared, but there's a few that like I still 
get to keep in contact with like that you know it's and it's really cool because it just it, it proves the point that you know it was it wasn't that it was wrong it was just really hard to it was just so brand new and so different to how they grew up you know and they as a parent mm-hmm. they just want the best for their kid you know that that's that, for sure that's all they want you know and, and they they see all these stories on the internet about you know uh, about this strange new culture that's happening and you, you if you've never met them then how do you really know them and it, it just but you know that it, in in a sense that was the birth of like having these like subcultures and these like these really niche communities because when i was mm-hmm. in junior high and high school like i all i did was play halo i was a swimmer and so when i was not in the pool i was playing video games and that was that was those are my two lives you know it, it, cuz swimming yeah. was two and a half hours in the morning two and, half, two and a half hours in the afternoon and then the rest of the time was video Hard games game. you know and uh you know but like the the all I wanted to talk about was no one, number one, no one knew any jargon for swimming. Yeah. I just didn't even bother, you know, like it, like that's some nerdy shit right there, you know, but number two, like with video games, I wanted to talk about the sick triple kill that I got in an MLG match, you know, yes. and, and no one, and it, they're just like, eh, cool. You know, like, I mean, it just, <laughs> so the internet was this birth and our, of the, of these subcultures, these sub communities. And I, I just, I remember looking back when high speed internet first came into existence back before we had dial up. I'm just like, this is going to change everything. Now I had, mm-hmm. I had no idea where it was going to go, but I just said, this is, no. I can play with people in the UK. I can have friends in New York. I can have friends in California. I can have like the, the world got a lot smaller, you know? Now we've got Dogecoin. Yeah. Um, now we got Nifties. <laughs> now we got Dogecoin. <laughs> you know, as you say, you never predict yeah. this stuff, right? Yeah. But like, I have, I have a little anecdote, but like, so around the time I was being told, I can't like go meet f- like friends who I met on the internet. Yeah. My dad went on. Uh, I think it's a UK only dating site. Mm-hmm. So like he'd broken up with my mum and yeah. it's called plenty of fish. <laughs> and now they, he's been married to a woman he found on there for like 10, 11 years. Fantastic. And it's like, oh, so you're okay to go uh, to a oh, different yeah. city, by the way, <laughs> you're allowed to go meet someone off the internet and it's completely fine. But when I do it, no. And I, I don't know if it's like the gaming aspect or just like the age aspect. I don't know. Cause when I became like 18, like that's entirely up to me whether I go or not, but it was still deemed as like weird or maybe yeah. uh, a massive health risk yeah. or something, you know? But yeah, I just find that funny. I, I only thought about it the other day. I was like, my dad was literally doing the exact thing he was telling me not to do. Right. And then he's found a lot of happiness out of that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm going to have a, have a word with him about that. I'm not going <laughs> to speak to him actually and see what the fuck happened there. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah, you know, have a, have a little heart to heart with him. Uh, you know, want to wanna go, there, there was something that stuck out to me, you know, out of all your articles on your Twitter, you know, that, that you post for Dick Sarrow. There was, you know, what was fascinating me the most, and part of it's it's a okay. curious question, like because you you you're you're an esports journalist, you know, you, you you do a lot of breaking stories, and your your Twitter headline is probably my favorite out of any headline that I've ever read. <laughs> you know, it says, "Yeah, because Adam Finch is going to break the biggest deal in esports. All his quote unquote sources are immortals, people, and he's getting to play like, and he's getting to play like a fiddle." <laughs> Where it's it's insane. Yeah, that's a Reddit comment though. <laughs> so. In in 2019, there was everything going down with Optic Gaming and Infinite being yeah. sold to yeah. Immortals, potentially, right? So there was Jacob Wolf and there was I yeah. um, reporting on this. And this was like my... I'd done a couple before that, uh, like scoops as such. I don't like saying that word, but a scoop yeah, yeah, as such. Yeah. And, it is what it is. But this was obviously my, my big break. Yeah. Um, and these people weren't really aware of me. Yeah. Uh, most of them probably still not. I like... Industry people know me, fans don't. Like, it's a weird dynamic, in fact. Strange. So I don't have a lot of followers, but the quality of followers are, is insane. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, so I, I accurately report, I put out a couple of reports within the space of a week, I think, about, like, the states of the deal, gave some information in, in terms of, like, there's a meeting coming up on X day, and this is going to decide the fate of how this goes. And, of course, there's not going to be many people who know about the business dealings right. of, like, these two um, huge companies, nice. right, with massive backing. Yeah. So... For, for whatever reason, they thought that I was maybe just like a puppet for Immortals. Mm. Um, and But I noticed there was never any comments about Jacob Wolf. So I, I think purely because it, there wasn't that trust factor there sure. yeah. in me, because yeah. I'd not really broken much that's relevant to them before that, they just assumed that. And plus, they're just a salty optic fan yeah. who were literally some of the yeah. worst and best fans in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't want to see their beloved optic, like get shipped off to another company that sure. was going to fuck them, which what? obviously Unders- happened understandable. over the next year. Yeah. Understandable. Yes. So they just decided to take it on me, mate. Yeah. And I just found it fun because it actually couldn't be more wrong. Yeah. Uh, I won't go further into that, right. but like it, it, what they, what they allege or what, what they surmise happened couldn't be more wrong. It's just like, no, you don't have a fucking clue, but like the irony of it and like, 
Also, it doesn't it sound fucking baller where it says like, yeah, as if Adam Fitch is going to break the biggest deal in esports. Yeah. yeah. I'm like, that sounds fucking sick. Actually, I'll have a, you said it, not me. Yeah. So there we go. I broke the biggest deal in esports. I'll take it. I don't get my credit for it, but that's one Reddit user deemed it to be so. So, so that's the case. Yeah. That's, that's something I've had in place for quite a while now. And, uh, it's, it's the best header I could ever think of. I was thinking about maybe making up my profile picture too, just to double down on it, but <laughs> I should probably keep my ugly mug there for now. But yeah, I'm glad you noticed that because yeah. not many people bring that up. It's just a funny little comment I saw. Yeah. And I thought I'm going to immortalize that. It's great. It's creative, man. You know, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny. Cause I, and it was, I, I didn't notice it up until literally like two days ago. I'm like, Oh, that's actually pretty, that's actually pretty funny. Um, you know, when it, when it comes to, you know, when it comes to these stories, I mean, op, like there's, you, you grew up Call of Duty, you grew up Halo, you grew up, I mean, you cover, I mean, so Dextero is really known for Call of Duty, you know? Um, yes. I mean, they, they're, they're a huge player in the scene. Um, do you want it to, and I know you write a lot about that and some of the optic happenings and, and there's a lot of news around that right now. When mm -hmm. it, my favorite game and my favorite, this is a completely selfish question, by the way. You know, uh, for sure. my, my bread and butter, I grew up playing Halo. It is the game that does it for me. It is, it is literally my pride and joy. You know, what do you currently see? Do you currently see with infinite coming out? Do you see any major change? Do you ever see Halo basically going back, like being at the same level as it was back in like MLG 06, 07, 08? I'm currently working on stories relevant to Halo esports right mm -hmm. now. So I, I think there's a lot of play in terms of its popularity. One, it has to have a good player base, sure. right? It has to have a, a, preferably a lot of players because yeah. the sample the sample of players to spectators is quite low in esports, right? So right. say it has 1 million dedicated players, maybe 10% or want to see the elite play, yeah. uh, which is probably uh, a very generous gift, right? <laughs> uh, like say, saying that's the case. But if we just break it down like that, so that's 100,000 people there. Right. Um, and then, and then you have to, I guess, get, get them to stick around Yeah. and then you have to be able to monetize them both on the team side and the league side. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that is down to the teams and the league. So I think there's a lot of play. Look what they've got Adam Apicella's esports engine, yep. uh, controlling the ship over there. I think uh, they've given him and his team a lot of trust. So it is basically MLG, like a reunion yeah. uh, for Halo. Yeah. Um, you, you won't be disappointed at organizational support of gotcha. teams early on when things get off the ground, whenever that may be. That I, is. Yeah. Yeah. I do not have a clue. Now I, I, I think there's some stuff in flux right now. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll say that much, but uh, I know Apicella has, he doesn't like being wrong and he likes, he right. likes what he likes and he likes Halo and he likes card and stuff. Right. Yeah. So he's going to do whatever he can. The fact that 343 have given him a lot of, a lot of saying, a lot of trust in this, I, I think should excite fans. Cool. Um, yeah, I am. Now, I, I think, yeah, and I, and I think what they should be aiming for is not is not to replicate what they had, but to like far surpass it because it was never like the biggest eSport. Right. It was never the most fruitful of games to operate in as far as I'm aware. So for me, like, I, I think they should just be looking to go bigger and better. But of course, like the, the fundamental thing is the game has to be good. Right. Right. So, and that's out of their control. Right. So... That's number one. It, so number one is infinite being good. Tick that off. Number two is um, them understanding how the fuck to like monetize this properly and create a product that is watchable. Number number two yep. done. And then third from there, I think sustainability and growing it. In fact, so like we've seen with the Overwatch League that came out doing well, but as since like it keeps dying down and they have to like shift the goalposts to make it seem like it's growing now. Right. So you want you don't just want sustainability, but you want that growth instead of the initial interest and then drop down, which you get at like. Sometimes you get in Call of Duty the, yeah. every year. They've got the new title out and stuff, right? So it's interesting at first, and then you realize, oh, it's a shit game, or I don't really care about these game modes or whatever. These maps are naff, right. so it's not really fun. So I think there's a lot at play there, but I have I have faith in Adam Apicella and his team at uh, Esports Engine, and I think fans should have too. Yeah. Uh, and I, I believe probably details are not too far away. Some details are not too far away. That's awesome. It's all I can say. Yeah, that. yeah. No, I don't I, know whether I'll break them or they'll get out there first, but I, I'm looking into it. I'll put it that way. Fantastic, man. I mean, yeah, because that's... I, and I don't need it to be the biggest esport in the world. Like, that. that's not... Like, I just... And the, the challenge that I see is that, especially with the community, like, they... 343 has probably one of the biz, biggest tasks, tasks out of any game publisher that I've ever okay. seen because yes. they have the responsibility... 
I mean, like, this is like, Halo is like the Star Wars of video games. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it, there is so much legacy and there's so much nostalgia that you need to keep, but you also are tasked with evolving the franchise yes. and, and, and make it to where the, because the Zoomers are going to be bringing in the bucks, but you've got to keep it happy for the boomers who want them to start, who, mm -hmm. who literally built Halo. You know what I mean? And, and I don't, I mean, to be honest, man, I don't envy their position because that is, that is one of the, the, the hardest fucking things I can ever think of doing, you know, and, and they, and they're simultaneously building a new engine, you know what I mean? So they're building a new engine to create this open world game and they're doing potentially a BR, like, how do you keep like the, the fundamentals, but still evolve it? And that's, I don't know. And that's not something I think you and I could answer, but you know, uh, that's my, my dog let me know. Um, but you know, that's just always, I wanted to, I wanted to hear your take on that. Um, and something that you mentioned, uh, is I think a, that, that something that I've always been interested in is that with the overwatch league, you know, like you have the, uh, the hype uh, goes up and then it goes down. And then you mentioned they shift the goalposts to make it appear like they're doing, yes. doing better. And that seems like a, a scratch on the surface to a much larger issue, you know, in esports. Um, you know, and, and I, there's a lot of numbers fluff. There's a lot of like, there's a lot of fluff in general around this, you know, and yes, is in your experience, do you think this is just par for the course to get to where it is more sustainable and company do companies have to do this or is there a better way? You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think well, I, I've literally just finished writing a piece about how like financial details are kept under wraps unless they're yeah. perceived as the biggest deal of all time. Right. Like, that's the only way they'll ever put anything out. Right. So I, I think companies for some reason are afraid to make it seem like they're not doing great. Mm. And I, I don't understand. I, I kind of do optics and shit, which I hate that word. That's just yeah. like the latest buzzword, buzzword really. Yeah. But yeah. Um, we all know esports is not too sustainable right now. Like right. as soon as COVID hit, like chaos had to drop their CSGO team. I think they had to do it in Rainbow Six as well. Like North, shut down and that they've got the financial backing of a film studio and the football team. Wow. Like yeah. uh, Re reciprocity dropped basically straight away. That's... There's probably more consolidation to come. Like Ugh, that made so... me upset. I, I love, I love Chad. I love, I, I got to meet him, you know, and it was just, mm -hmm. a, uh, sorry that. Yeah. Anyway. No, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. No, it's fine. I mean, yeah, it was a strange time, wasn't it? It's yeah. just see, see, so seeing these teams flop <laughs> like into nothingness, like just go. Yeah. It's, it's a strange one. So, the the industry is propped up via sponsorships. Right. Um, no exact terms of these sponsorships are ever released willingly mm. as a rule, right? So mm -hmm. straight away, there's smoke and mirrors and there's fuckery there. And then you try and understand the, the value of them. You never get that because they don't want to put the value out. Um, because say, say I sign a media rights deal and I'm ESL. And then Blast have also got um, a media rights deal with the same company I've just signed. I don't want to put my value out there because then Blast have that information and they can try and play things off of that, right? Uh, and it may be revealed that they've been fucked over or that they've done proportionately well compared to Blast. So there's a lot of a lot of bullshit there. Some like inside baseball in a sense. Yeah. Um, where yeah, it's it's really tough to know the true state of the industry. This is my thing. I don't know how well esports is doing. I, I fear. That it's not doing well at all, and that's why everything's hidden. Because if, if it was going well, people would want to be bragging about this shit, right? Yeah. If ESL were doing great, yeah. if ESL were absolutely smashing it in CSGO, they'd be shouting about that. Mm -hmm. If Glass were doing great, they'd be shouting about that. Instead, they'll shout about the investment they've got, but they've never said whether it's like a debt raise right. or how much they how much of the company they've had to give away, all that kind of stuff. And that's why I'm thankful now we're getting public uh, companies in esports. And I mean, look, they're somewhat transparent, as transparent as they have to be legally, right. but doesn't mean they're giving away everything. So you've got sure. like the likes of Guild, the likes of Astralis, uh, Enthusiast Gaming, uh, Lookbox, which is a, a bookie. Um, so like we're slowly but surely starting to get information in which we can actually work out the true value yeah. of these teams and such. And when we have more information, we can then create a better estimate of the true value of the industry and the state it's in. Until then, I don't have a bloody clue and it makes it very hard for me. Like I really struggle to get information on broadcast right deals, even though... Mm. I know all the people I need to know yeah. on that front, for the most part, realistically. But they will never give that stuff away. But they're saying media rights is what's going to set esports free. Because if you look at like, the Premier League, their whole business model is set around like broadcast deals, uh, yeah. television rights and stuff, right? Um, and ESL and Blast, right, even Riot Games, are all reporting more and more and more, announcing each year more media rights deals. But we never find out the value of those. We never find out exactly what it entails, how long they're for. Normally, is not a thing as well. Yeah. Um, the exact investment on either side is not known. So 
to me, they could just be giving them a feed and then saying, there you go, you get two people, pay them shit amount of money mm-hmm. and they'll cast over it in their native tongue. Like yeah. that could be the extent of that stuff. Like that's not really that appealing in my opinion. Yeah. So, but then you've got some, you've got some broadcast companies that will do complete shoulder content around uh, the, the streams and, and the tournaments as well. But I think that's a, a detail in the deals. So like it's varying so much, but we just get this told the same shit. It's like, oh, we've done a deal with this with this company we've done a deal with that company it's like okay but how, how do these differ right. we don't know yeah. and it's really hard to get this information i'm trying my best but there's maybe two or three good business re- decent business reporters in the industry yeah. right so uh, at least in the west i don't know about the east they probably they might have a couple over there but sure. then again it's china and stuff and it's a uh if they say anything they'll just get assassinated right so <laughs> yeah uh, no, no, kid, no kidding man <laughs> you know what yeah. i mean like they'll just suddenly go missing yeah and be found in a forest or some mad shit yeah. where yeah but like we don't talk about that in these parts we never mentioned about how fuck china is and then you think about oh 10 cents chinese and they own 100 percent of riot and i think like 40 percent of epic like right. they have ownership state like supercell like yeah. across the board almost we never talk about that stuff, but but regardless, um, actually, interestingly, so the, the biggest media rights deal of all time was announced recently between Riot Games and Huyo, which is a Chinese live stream platform. Mm-hmm. I saw that. Um, so Riot Games is owned 100% by Tencent. Huyo is 50.1%, so a majority owned mm. by Tencent. So this is Tencent going, hey, Tencent, <laughs> that looks good. We could give you money for that. And then the other Tencent's like, how much you got? Right. And then Tencent's like, 310 mil? <laughs> And they're like, yeah, that'll do. That's enough to top the 300 mil report that came out a few years ago yeah. between another Riot Games deal. <laughs> that was, you know what I mean? It's just so convenient. Right. Um, it's, it's, it's actually groundbreaking stuff. So we'll get the information there, the financial information on those deals, of course, but not any other ones. So I, I think it's all smoke and, smoke and mirrors and it's all shielded and it's, it's all played carefully because yeah. the industry is not in a great state and most of these companies are not doing well. Like that's the only reason I can think of because if they're doing great they'd be fucking shouting about it from the rooftops yeah I mean it's so something that I watched uh was what it was a, it has nothing to do with esports but I think it's very relevant to what we're talking about was that you know when I was watching some of the documentaries on like when when like web 2.0 was really starting to, to come into its own you know uh mm-hmm. brands started to have social media accounts you know and it was kind of like that rise of, of of social media and like you know Domino's for the lo- Domino's pizza for the longest time they were they were blasted on social media like their you know their crust was horrible their cheese tasted like you know uh was gritty like it was just it, there was and and people were not shy about letting them know this but mm-hmm. you know it wasn't this this podcast isn't about pizza although i love pizza but it, it's so um it was domino's response to that you know and, and, it, and it touches on what you've been talking about like they came out like very uh they came out very honest and transparent and said look our crust sucks our cheese sucks, you know, like we suck right now, you know, basically like what would make it better. And that was such a, that was such a voodoo thing. And like such a, like, you don't do that kind of thing, but now look at them. You know what I mean? Like they came out and owned their shit, you know, and they came out and public, you know, and, and obviously they're two different company, two different types of industries and companies, but there's it talking about human psychology. Like we were in the beginning, like the, there's a fundamental thing about being transparent and vulnerable you can't really yes. measure the outcome of what's going to come, but you know, it always comes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's, yeah. there's always a solution that comes when you finally admit what the damn problem is, but until for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah. You look at like flashpoint. Yeah. Like the, the only, I, I, I respect Monty and I think he's an honest guy, but Thorin's the only one who's like fully lives his truth at every moment. Doesn't search for the PR mm-hmm. angle on stuff. Right. So, the fact that he just came out and said, look, like these teams who spent two mil each, like didn't hold up, hold up their end of the bargain. Yeah. Like we've not been able to fulfill what we needed to do. They've got, they don't even have a roster. And if they do, it's a shit roster. Like they're not, they're not putting up the money that they said they would do. Like I'm fucking out of here because it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Like they're not fulfilling their end of the bargain and I've done mine. So that's people dislike him a lot. For some reason, I don't really understand why, because he's, he's confrontational and he's definitely himself. Yeah. But like that level of honesty is good. It's just like, okay. He, he made it, he made everyone aware beforehand, like, I'm going to like detach myself from this as the moment it becomes something it's not supposed to be. Sure. Um, and look like if he stayed with it, we wouldn't know half of the stuff that we know now. So that, that to me paints a very honest picture of what's going on, but you still don't really hear the teams talking about like their involvement. Right. I, I've spoken to a few people involved in Flashpoint and like the B site, the ownership group, who have all, they all co-owned the league. Mm-hmm. 
And um, look, I, I ask them a question about that. And they just say, yeah, we're working on it. You know, we're still, it's going to go well, blah, blah, blah. It's just like, no, nah, just own up to some shit. Right. They never will. They never will. Like, I, don't, I don't trust corporations ever realistically. I don't really trust companies. I don't think they can have any real values. I don't think they can uphold any values because it's all collective of, people's, uh, collective of people and these people come and go. So things right. change. It's like a living organism. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not just a static thing. So like, that's when Riot come out and say they like stand on certain topics and then there's like the neon deal, for example, which spits in the entire face of that. It's just like, mm. okay, like, uh, uh, yeah, it's too contradictory. Like my brain just like crashes when I think of that stuff Yeah, because it is literally crazy. So yeah, I, I don't tend to trust that stuff, but like what's stopping every employee of Riot coming out and, and going against this stuff or like, you know what I mean? Like that's, that's more impressive to me. Um, so there's a lot of virtue signaling that can go on. Like Domino is obviously different. They're just saying we're shit. They're not saying, oh, we yeah. stand for this. We don't right. stand for this, blah, blah, blah. Right. Uh, and I, I think owning your shit is important. Like I, on a very micro scale, like I was very wrong about Guild Esports, which came out. I thought they were cash grab. I've got like a 12 minute video uh, on my YouTube channel, which is still live now, where I just literally just attempt to destroy them for like 12 minutes yeah. and dis discuss how bad they are for the industry and everything. And in like nine to 10 months, they just like proved me massively wrong. So I realized that and I was like, okay, I'm going to, going to put something out about this because right. like, I, I felt, I felt indebted to them. I was like, well, if I, I, I fucked up, you proved me wrong. Here's your, here's your flowers and right. stuff, you know? Um, and I tried to uphold that way of living, but like I, I've realized over time, trying like expecting other people to operate the way you do. It's hard. Yeah. You it, it, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just, you're just going to be disappointed time after time. Yeah. You know, so I, I expect what we get in esports right now. And whenever a deal comes out where there's actually a numerical value attached to it, or there's a bit of transparency there, like I, I, I'll stand up and I'll applaud them and I'll recognize it and I'll be pleasantly surprised. But uh, the, the default reaction for me is, okay, I'm not going to find out about this. I'm going to try and ask, and then it's going to get shielded. I'll never know. Yeah. And then I can't help the industry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so it's it's a really tough one, mate, and I, that's why I'm trying to get more people into this line of work. Um, the only thing is, like, it's not as perceived to be as sexy because you're not interviewing the players that you right. really like. A lot of the yeah. journalists in our industry are realistically like Eminem's Stan, who just want to be close to the teams and the players and the orgs, and they want to be there at the after parties and get the autographs and stuff. Like, I have stories about that that I can tell you right. off of here. Um, where literal journalists, literal like broadcast talent and stuff like doing shit they shouldn't do right. in their position in my opinion at least right because you're there to do a job you're not there to be a fan right. with privileged access like so yeah yeah I, I i think a lot of them are in it for the the wrong reasons so the ones that seem to be in it for the right reasons i'm trying to do what i can because the competition helps me in a sense it yeah. definitely helps the industry there's no there's no downside to having more people who are in the pursuit of truth in my opinion it, so it, 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 exactly i mean and you know and i actually interviewed jacob uh jacob wolf on this uh podcast a little while ago and it, and it was you know and i i i had a hard time believing that he was like 23 years old you know what i mean like it was it was it was crazy to see his established career at such a young age um and i think one of one of what you touched on is like one of the reasons why he's good at what he does is because he he's there to do a job and he does the job you know there's no you know of course he's a human and it's hard to detach some of the emotion from it but he does a really good job at it you know and he he, he reports facts you know yeah and, and at least from what i've seen um you know so it, it's a it, it kind of helps you stand out like in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense you know what i mean oh uh, yeah all i will say on that is um yeah, that's fine. People are entitled to their stance and stuff. I think he's a good guy. I think uh, he has done a lot of great work yeah. in, in the past. So I, I can say that. There's also things that worry me mm. based on what I've heard, but I have no verifiable proof on those things at, at this point. Gotcha. So I'm not going to tire him with a brush that I'm unaware of. But yeah, I, I mean... Uh, on the business side, Jacob will occasionally drop in and do some business stuff. There's me, there's Kevin Hit, and then there's basically a bunch of um, journalists, uh, PR regurgitators in business yeah. reporting right now. And I'm trying to light a fire under their ass by calling them out and, and changing that, you know. I'd, I'd love to. So, yeah. look, like, I, with, with with Jacob, like, to be complete, completely candid, like, it's hard to not realize that he's done well with himself because that's, he, he takes every chance he can to remind people of that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. which is not my style at all but um yeah i remember there was a conversation about say uh, i think it was like using lawyers when you're signing contracts mm -hmm. 
and, and fielding job offers and making sure like you get the right terms and stuff. He, and I remember he tweeted out like when I was field like going through all 30 job offers I got, like yeah. when I left ESPN, I'm just like, come on. There's like, there's a time and place for all this stuff. So he's more boastful than, than I am in my, in my life, mm-hmm. which is fair enough. I tend to just like keep shit moving and yeah. I, I, I take criticism and praise the exact same. Gotcha. It just goes, it goes. Yeah. And then I carry on. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah. like, it's the smallest knock. But so fair play, he he does what he needs to do. Um, I don't have um, any proof of him doing anything wrong, so I'm not going to assume yeah. he does anything wrong. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, I certainly don't mention some sense. And, and look, I th- I think we'd benefit from having doing uh, business reporting more, uh, the same as anyone who wants to step up and do it properly. Like we benefit from that. Yeah. Is, is what I shall say. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, <laughs> and it, it's 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 funny, like uh, um. It's funny with this industry the way it is. Like you know, it, we're we're in this wild wild west, and like the, I think what people don't tend to realize is that we are actually creating an industry that wasn't there twenty to thirty years ago. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like like you look at marketing agencies. Well, that's been around since you know, or you know, like that's been around for a hundred years. You know, like you look at as long as they've been selling shit, right? Yeah, I mean, they're you know, uh, commerce, you know, clothing, food. I mean, these are all like they have industry best practices. They do this, and I think that's what a lot of people sometimes forget is that like we're in this process of like building it. And I, this is just my take on it. I feel like if that message was communicated at every level, you know, then companies would not need to hide behind numbers. They would not need to hide behind certain decisions because if, if the, if the community understands the message, if we all come together on this one thing that like, we're still building something, this is not established. Mm -hmm. Like this is, this is not like, you know, this is brand fucking new, you know? Um, now it may not solve the problem entirely. Humans are going to be humans, but like, I think, that's just my take that it would be a lot better received. It's like, oh, well, remember, we're building something. This is not something we're undoing. This is not something that's been done before. Like, we're creating it. And if you find that something can be done better, speak up. You know what I mean? Like, we yeah. need to hear that. That somewhat goes against the narrative that sold to get a lot of the investment in the industry, though. And that, that sucks. We, this, this has grown so quick. Like, football took 100 years to be a commercial success. We took 15, 20 years. Right. You know what I mean? Like, like the narratives that, that sold is like, people say we're in a ever-changing industry or rapidly growing industry. And I don't see that much that changes. Like, mm. realistically now, we're at the point where the status quo is almost there. Like, things are updating and and um, a new title can come out and blow some shit out of the water. Right. And I, I just try to remind people that, like, as a as an industry, there are no like best practices because yeah, we are building the plane as we're flying it, right? right. Um, I, I, there's an identity issue, in my opinion, where <clears throat> you can see it among teams right now. I can name some examples, but some think we're a sports industry, some think we're a media industry, mm-hmm. and they operate very differently. Yep. So if we're trying to be a sport, that's that's one thing, and we can mimic the way they do things, which is what Overactive Media are doing with. Um, with Toronto Defiance, Toronto Ultra, Mad Lions, previously Splice, or you can go about it the media way and the lifestyle kind mm-hmm. of content way. Of course, your, your Phase and your Optics 100 Thieves and, and such. Yeah, yeah. Uh, optics for sure, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> I think we don't know which ones can be successful. There's a chance none right. or all can be successful. Uh, we don't know what approach is best yet. So operating as if there's best standards and, and uh, best practices is, is pointless for me at the moment. And also that's why I think like, a certificate at this point makes no real sense. And plus it's not a specialized industry in that sense. Well, it's again, it's, it's a bunch of subcultures, but within that there are all the same jobs that have been before besides playing video games professionally. Right. You've got people in production, people in event ops, you've got journalists, yeah. you've got talent, yeah. like uh, all the people behind the scenes, there's people who work in finance, uh, generating revenue, uh, leading teams, all this kind of stuff. Right. So it's the same, but, it's just got all the nuances of that esports has. Right. So for me, like trying to like uh, operating as if it's in a, a mad unicorn, in a sense it is because it's not been done before. But also, it just takes from a bunch of other places. Is like you can't teach esports specialist knowledge beyond like the very basics of what right. the industry is. Right. So that's why I, I think we need more gate- gatekeeping in the industry because I think liking video games isn't a qualification. Mm. Some people think they should work in esports. Oh, I love League of Legends. I've played it for ten years. And so what, what do you bring to the table? Right. Like what you join an organization, what can you bring besides excitement? Right. Like, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so 
I don't know how, what, what form the gatekeeping would take, but I, I'm all for people with experience and qualifications from other industries, from universities, coming into esports, as long as they obviously want, want to be in it for esports and not because it's like sports or whatever. Yeah. Because if you come from sports for 30 years and you come into esports, you're used to operating one, one way. And if you're viewing this industry as the exact same thing, you're going to operate the same way and then you'll probably get left behind, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, it's, a, it's a tough one where it's very familiar like on a granular level, but on a macro level, it is entirely different. And there's kind of an identity crisis from the people within it as to what, what this is supposed to be and, and what form it's going to take. Yeah. Um, and I don't, th I don't think there's any right answer at the moment. In fact, we, we're not at a point where we know that yet. Right. Uh, we have to wait until this promise of it blowing up actually is realized, presuming it will. Right. Because uh, this is like a very big gamble, this entire industry still. It is. Like the Overwatch League is probably the industry's biggest gamble, but like I think about it, the industry is a big gamble because it's, it's the same old narrative, and I've said this a couple of times before, but in 10 years, esports will be X. And right. then we get a year on, it's like, in 10 years, esports will be X, a year on. In 10, and it's just like, when is this mystical time frame going to come in, come into play where it's now huge and everyone's making money and... Yeah. And we've got we've got everything figured out. I don't I don't know when that'll be. Uh, so I tend to try and stay away from that. And I'm just I, I do remind people we're building a plane as we fly it. That's what makes it daunting and fucking annoying sometimes. But also what makes it really exciting because you 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 feel part of something, right? Yeah. And it's like if I get in early now in 20 years, like yeah. this shit's going to be insane. It's right. not even going to be recognizable, right? Right. Uh, how it is now in, in terms of like where it'll be in 20 years if if the last 20 years have been anything to go by at least. So. Yeah. That's that's where I get most of my excitement from. Um, but my job, yeah, is to look at the negatives. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean, it, but you know, it's there's always two sides of the story. You know what I mean? Like, there's always there's always you know the, the positive wouldn't be positive if you didn't have like the real or the or the negative sure. or whatever you know whatever you want to call it. Um, and and you brought up an interest, you know, like it, it, and depending on like we don't need to go too far down the rabbit hole. But we can if we want, but like you know, the question I have about like, kind of like the certificate that you mentioned, you know, obviously that was a huge topic about two, three weeks ago, about a month ago. Mm -hmm. Um, well, my day, my, my time period is so fucked right now. So it's probably about two weeks ago. Um, but you know, <laughs> things move fast on the internet. Right, it, they really, they really do. Like my, you know, from your perspective, like, do you think that just the timing of what they were doing was off or do you think that it's completely irrelevant to begin with? You know what I mean? Like, do you I, I, yeah, yeah. That's a good question. I don't think timing, I think. I think the premise was naffed. I think the intentions depends. If you want to believe their intentions, they were good. If you want to believe the intentions that came across via the project and the product, not good. Mm -hmm. I think the communication fucked them massively. Um, so I, I think from from beginning to end, from top to bottom, like there's there's a place for something. Yeah, but it, it wasn't this right. Yeah. and <clears throat> I've got a lot of information on this i've like spoken to people and I, I literally seen the messages they sent out when they decided to dead the project and mm -hmm. they called it but they said that they got super leaked because like 13 advisors pulled out within like four hours yeah, yeah. um but i also know there was no centralized communication hub for this so they would go out to each of the the advisors and ask some bullshit, get them a part of it give them a small bit of equity but a lot of them most of them maybe all of them maybe not i'd say all, uh, most just to be safe uh didn't actually know what the product was when it was going live, right? Yeah. So Monty said on Four Horsemen that he was actually contacted. Imagine if he just said yes to that and then it went live like two days later and he didn't have time to go through and look at things. He'd be attached to a product which doesn't really yeah. represent his views and such, right? And I think some people may have been caught up in that, but also if they're attaching themselves to something, they need to be aware of what they're attaching themselves to, right? Which makes me think it is somewhat of a status game for some of them. Um, so, so I think communication was poor because... Um, look like the, the advisors were actually there to be mentors. So you, you pay the $400, you pass a certificate, and then you get into a Discord where you can theoretically sure. um, men, be mentored by and network with these people. Yeah. Um, that was not communicated. They were working or attempted to work with universities and colleges to get scholarships. A lot of the advisors were going to put up money themselves uh, as scholarships for, to get people in it for free. There was the, the pay what you can afford um, kind of model on the study guide, which wasn't pushed enough. Right. Uh, they said they were trying to um, eradicate uh, nepotism and cronyism, but them assembling their board was cronyism because they just picked their friends 
Um, they said they were going to try and eradicate gatekeeping, yes, but like they put a four hundred dollar price pool on this, and right. they said like this is going to help identify who's good and who's not, or who's uh, worthy and who's not, which is a form of gatekeeping. Like everything they did was just antithetical to what they actually thought it was going to do, and they didn't even make use of the people they had involved. Gotcha. Um, and and look like they had Jens Hilger, uh, Malte Barth, and Sebs from Bitcrafters themselves. So like they had three Bitcraft people, which is a venture capital fund, probably the most prevalent in industry. Yep. And they're saying they're not doing it to make money. Why the fuck would they be involved if they didn't want to make money? That's their whole job. That's their whole MO. Right. That's why you're all working to make money. So how can you say this wasn't any sort of like attempt to make It's just fucking mental to me. Like it was some sort of like gift to the people. And yeah. like, what, what happened if like, so they have like G, CEOs from G2, FlyQuest, um, Misfits, Evil Geniuses all involved. What if those organizations, because they're attached to it via the literal head of their organization said, you know what? We're going to filter it through and only ECI uh, applicants in the US are going to get even considered for this shit. Mm. Imagine if that stuff happened. I heard that wasn't the case, but you never know what could happen. Right, in the right, right, right. Yeah, you don't know. What could happen down the line. There's a bunch of bullshit I could go on with this. So while I would love to say it was one thing, I think it was an amal amalgamation of just a lot of incompetence, a lot of, I'd say echo chamber, but like they didn't even actually consult the people who were there to be consulted with. So a lot of people didn't know what it was going to be like when it went out. So from, from top to bottom, front to back all of it i'm just like what the fuck is this and that's gotcha. without even touching on like the actual exam content. itself yeah and the, yeah the content of it which like they had no educators on the board they had no comms people on the board they had a pr agency and the communication was still shit so like wow. it's just like grow to me gross incompetence all the way through um and as as other information which may come out at some point they said it's paused uh, i've heard from a few people that it's dead it's not paused mm. but it's scrapped um and they only did it after the the four hour thing where like a third, I think it's literally 30% of the advisors said they wanted to be removed. That's wild. So not, not a fan as you, yeah. as you maybe have to tell. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> like, cause like, I, I like the idea of it, you know, like I liked the, you know, like the idea of having, because, it, 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 because the, the problem in this industry is that like, well, at least from what I viewed and, uh, or the way, the way I viewed is that the, the people in esports don't know how to communicate what they want. You know, they don't know how to yes. communicate. And, and then people who want to be in the industry and who have the skills don't know how to communicate the actual skill set beyond the title. And I think it's not one or the other. I think it's both of them at the same time, because even with me, okay. like I have a very like, you know, like very customer centric, very relationship driven, very this. And, the, and there's a, there's a really, there's a challenge, especially with the younger age of like, quantifying, you know, your value and enlisting skills that are transferable to the job that you're applying for, you know? Um, okay. And so that's just the way I, that's just the way I view it. And that's kind of why I'm actually a part of um, the Enlight program, like the unit from, yes. from Unis. And I, Unis Chen, yeah, yeah. And I think that's a fantastic program because it's... A lot of people were saying the ECI should be this. And I'm like, that's literally existing already. It does. It's literally end light. Yeah. yeah. I, I remember. Yeah. And she was part of the board of course as well. The advisory board for ECI, yeah. which I don't know. Um, but sorry, as you were no, saying, no, no, like, it, yeah, it, it seems a good idea. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's okay. And it, 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 it goes back to what we talked about really like way earlier. Like, it's like, you know, these, I learn more from podcasts, from, from live speakers, from people who have done it from just, just random videos that I can watch whenever I want and learn when I want, you know? And so, Part of that, kind of like I just thought about this, like it, it kind of makes you wonder, like, is, you know, is the future, like the way we get there, is this by individual companies like what Eunice is doing, or is it by a board? You know, because like a board is very similar to that, kind of like a higher education system, you know, and we're finding out that that's not really working as well, you know, with, with non-specialized specific industries. You know what I mean? So yeah, do, yeah. Is it, is, trying to launch like an official body right. in esports is impossible. Yeah. Because it's so fragmented, yeah. um, as as I said before, like the uh, and it's, it's pretty obvious at this point. Like they've all got each scene, each game has got its own ecosystem at play, right? And they're all controlled differently. Right. So you're you're ex to to have an official board of absolutely anything in esports, realistically, I, I I think won't happen across the board. I think it'll happen in some small cases, micro cases, sure. but. Envisioning like Valve, Riot Games, all the organizations, all the other devs, Activision, Blizzard, all that kind of stuff, all saying, yes, we recognize this one thing. Yeah. Like, it's going to be very, very tough. And then, like, yeah, we're going to appoint these people right. to 
be in charge of whatever it may be. So we've got like eSports Bar, which is like the, the lawyer stuff by Bryce Blum and stuff like pile of shit. We've got ECI, pile of shit, they've got no say. We've got the British eSports Association, they're trying to be official, but they're not official. We've got like Newell and NSC for like university eSports in the UK. They both claim to be like the national body. Neither actually realistically are. Like it's, it's a bunch of shit. And and it's not, <laughs> it's not going to go anywhere, man. I just don't see a, a way in which that can happen because how can you govern an industry that's so fragmented and, and so nuanced. Right. Yeah. Like, I just don't, even like the official stuff we've got with like the CSPPA, like the Counter-Strike uh, Player Association, like it does fuck all. Like we've, we've assembled that, like the LCS one, I'm pretty sure was being paid by Riot uh, so, mm -hmm. <laughs> in some way. So it's just like, that's not in the best interest of the players at all. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever see like an official body of anything I, realistically. I just don't think it works. You know, I, I, like at least at, this, at least in this stage of it, you know, it, it, it. Yeah, they only have value if people place value in it, if people believe in it. Right. It's like ECI, like that 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 um, qualification wouldn't mean anything unless employees were recognizing it and, and um, potential employees wanted to grab it because they thought it helped their chances. It's the same with Bitcoin. It's the same with Dogecoin. It's the same with dollars. It's the yeah. same with pounds. Like yeah. it's all belief and value, like belief systems, which drives the value, right? And, and the market decides on that. Right. Um, you don't, the market uh, so does. If no, if some quote unquote regulatory board comes into esports and we just don't take it serious and we just go, well, we're not going to play by those rules because like we're not mandated to. Right. Uh, unless it's like literally like riot forcing it or something along those lines, you know. But as long as it's not like the United Front and everyone's appointed this, like it's not going to fucking happen. So like ECI, like it's not going to happen unless you've got mainstream adoption of it across all of the prevalent organizations, in my opinion. Yeah. And even then, you'll have people like me, like Richard, like Thorin, and then like everyone in the community actually just fucking rattling off against them. Yeah. And they'll have to make a decision. And typically the fans win. Yeah. Uh, we just saw that with like the Super League um, in, in European fo football or soccer, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the, the fans and the people who actually produce the money, the ones whose money you want, they tend to dictate a lot. They hold a lot of power, especially in an industry where it's not making that much money. Well, sure. I mean, you, you look at, there's an example outside of esports that I want to bring in. It's extremely relevant. Like you look at, uh, you know, Dave, or I mean, this is an easier example, Taylor Swift, you know, like she, uh, she didn't feel like she was getting the right, you know, uh, say in, 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 in her latest records. And like, she didn't feel like she was yes. getting paid enough. So what did she do? She went and re-recorded the same album and, 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 and published it under her studio and got all the rights. And she didn't have to abide by this contract that was signed. And same thing with Dave Chappelle, you know, what he did was he understood his value to where you know, he may, while he may have signed his life away in a shitty Netflix deal, you know, that, that yeah. gave him, that didn't give him anything. Well, he also has a rabid fan base. You know, he has a, he has a massive fan base that he just told them not to watch it. Therefore it hurt the pockets of Netflix and therefore they were forced to renegotiate the contract. You know what I mean? Says a lot. It's, it's insane. And you know, in, in like, like, yeah, you can say he signed his, you say he signed away in this contract, but like, was it right to begin with? Were the were was it just one person holding power that forced him to do that to get to where he wanted to be? But now, it's a very open. It's kind of just like a it's like a pirate ship. You know what I mean? Like everyone's kind of like fending mm -hmm. for themselves, and it's the people. It's democratizing. You know, a lot of this a lot of this content. And it's democratizing. You know, like money now. It's democ the people are creating their own economies. For God's sake, for sure. Imagine if someone says like we're going to be the de facto Counter Strike circuit. Yeah. Right, and they say we're going to literally put on the best thing, and everyone's going to want to join our, us and not join you. And then the fans are just like, no, nah, I don't like the product. We prefer what we've got in place. Like they're not going to last long. Right, they're not going to last long whatsoever. Even if all the teams are on board, if the fans are like, nah, this is fucked. Like if no one's watching, then you're not generating the money that you need from sponsorships and right. everything else. Your broadcast deals, apparently, which are worth fucking so much money, apparently, yeah. <laughs> um, and every, and ticket sales, merch, like all the other footfair that that goes on at these uh, events, right? So that it's the best way to like money is the only language these a lot of these companies will actually understand, right? And and fortunately. Um, and, and unfortunately, esports fans are the crux of that, of course. Mm -hmm. But they're not worth very much at the moment, and the task is getting them to be worth a lot. And I think part of that is waiting for the, like the generational, just like aging up of the current fans yep. uh, to where they have a, um, like disposable income. Because at the moment, there's quite a lot of young fans, right? You want them to be 30, 40, yep. or maybe like 25 up to however old, yep. where they can afford to just buy all the shit that they want to flog. That's right. You know, whereas if you're 15, it's a lot harder to be able to afford a $100 hoodie. Yeah. 
that's only released every three months for like 12 seconds. Yeah, it says, like, yeah, like it's, it's ridiculous. Sounds like you were targeting 100 Thieves there. <laughs> right, I'll target anyone who I does know. that, but I mean, they came to mind. They came to yeah. mind. Yeah, but yeah, so. I'm a, and I'm like, a fan. Like, like, was, I'll gladly do that. I like, I like, I that's and I enjoy that, but I can afford that. You know what I mean? So that's that's fair, exactly. Yeah. And, and that you're the kind of fan we want in, right. in esports, right? Collectively, yeah, because you, you'll pay for shit, yeah, uh, and you'll you'll help afford like these overblown, like salaries that players don't actually deserve at the moment because they're not justifying it um but then again we're getting that in journalism yeah. now as well a little bit where there's a few writers who are getting paid way more than they'll ever be able to recoup mm. uh and they're willingly accepting that because you would wouldn't you yeah. like yeah if you're let's let's throw some random numbers out there and uh i will not necessarily allude to anyone who i'm referring to here i could all, all i would say is they're perhaps up and coming um take whatever you want from yeah, yeah. From, from that ridiculous hint but say and i will make up the numbers here even though i do the numbers say they're getting paid 200 grand a year but they recoup and they generate 25 grand in revenue. worth in revenue how the fuck do you justify having them attached right. right you don't but if you know you're not bringing that much to the table but they are offering you that you're going to take that shit as long as you can, right? And I know this is a very different point, but like this is what we're starting to see in journalism now, which is obviously something uh, we see in the player front a little bit as well, where they're paid a lot more than what they're actually worth. Mm -hmm. uh, but you kind of have to have that skin in the game, or else you're viewed as not taking shit seriously, and right. you can't progress at all. So it's a bit of a, a bit of a fucked up dynamic. But um, yeah, I think more information will come out about that up and coming thing I was mentioning yeah, at, yeah. at some point. Maybe not from me. I'd love to. Um, don't think i'm necessarily in the right position to do so yeah but uh yeah it's, it's some stuff that i don't necessarily agree with in the industry which i'd love to change but some bits i can't yeah and i'm trying i've been trying to grapple with the fact that i can't change shit like yeah. I, I was literally on a, on a um a podcast yesterday and uh i was just uh, we were basically trying to put the world to rights like this is how everything should be right and then i was like yeah but like i can moan as much as i want on twitter and write as many articles and op-eds as i want but like that doesn't necessarily have to change anything unless it incites the right people to make that change and to agree with me and stuff. Right. Right. So trying to grapple with that as someone who's, I view it like we're putting out the truth in, a, in an attempt to make the industry more honest and thus better. Yeah. Like trying to grapple with the fact that I realistically can't change shit by myself. That's, that's been a fun one trying to get my head around for the past couple, it's tough. couple of weeks, realistically, you know, but, um, it just makes me want to keep putting out the, the right information, though, at least. Put out as much as I can, especially on like, the financial side, which I've, we've just discussed quite a bit. Yep. Put out as literally as much as I can on that front, and then everyone can make their mind up. But, like, my job's done. My job is, like, right. getting that information and putting it out there. Like, you do whatever you want with it. I'm not here to fix or fuck the industry up. I don't care anymore. It's just, like, I'll do my job, and then the rest is up to everyone else, you know? Yeah. Uh, I, but I don't have a huge amount of faith in a lot of the executives we've got in the industry right now who are the decision makers. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it, it, and it's uh, it's just a lack of maturity in the industry, to be honest. You know, um, it's just a it, and there and there's I think one of the biggest challenges or something that I saw was that you know esports is like a, a a pull from from a lot of different things. Like it's it's it, it, it's it's sports, but then it's got this huge media component to it. You know, and it, mm -hmm. and it's got individual personalities and their own economies, and you have orgs and you have subcultures and you have all of this operating at the same time. But I. I think it's a natural human inclination. It's a natural human uh, reaction to go off of what history tells us, you know. But I, but I think what we're, you know, the way I see it is that we're 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 looking at the wrong history. We're looking at the history of media, the history of sports, the history of this. But instead of let's look at the history of people. Let's look at the history of communities. Let's look at the history of like how these things were built. And like I think we're I think we're in the right to look at history, but I think we're looking at the wrong history you know, to make us feel better. Okay. You know what I mean? Um, cause if you look at people, you know, people don't change. People do the same shit. People like, mm -hmm. you know, like even with what we're doing with like the, the whole, you know, crypto and, 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 and blockchains and, and all these in, in, and smart contracts, like it's not, it's not the technology that's the same. That's the new thing. But you look at the adoption of the internet, like, you know, in the, in the late nineties, the internet was a fad. It was stupid. Like, you know, there was, there were, it's going to fail. Um, you look at in the late nineties, early two thousands, there was a shitload of attention, all this investment, you know, like, like all, all this money being poured in the industry, but they didn't know what they were pouring it into. And then about 3% of the companies survived, you know, like Amazon, Google, Facebook, you know, there was some gems mm -hmm. that came from that, but the human behavior around like this gold rush mentality is not new. 
you know? No, no. So, and I, 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 I say that example, you know, we don't have, you know, like I, I'm still learning about crypto, you know, so I don't know a whole lot about it, but you know, you look, instead of looking at the history of technology, you just look at the history of humans and there's your answer, you know, like, like how did humans do this in the nineties? How did humans do this in the eighties in the seventies and the sixties? Okay. Well, how did, like, even if there was a lot of social issues that were not worked through people still behave it, people, People aren't unique. Like we already like people are people. Yeah. You know? Um Yeah, then the medium changes, but that's about it. Yeah. Like expecting like human nature to change over the course of like a hundred years or whatever is is obviously not no. It's not, not gonna happen. So I understand what you're saying and I and I kind of alluded to it like the the market thing I was on about earlier, where like you study the principles and, and work yeah. out how the fucker how these fuckers operate yeah. and then you just change the medium changes but the and maybe the message changes, but like well, no, it's actually the messaging yeah. changes, but the message itself is it's the, the same, same always, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, now all we've got to do is package that up and sell it to everyone. Yeah. And then we become like instant trillionaires. Right. <laughs> uh, well, it's your, it's your, it's your theory and, and, and your way, your perspective, actually, your philosophy. So I'll let you have that. Yeah. But um, <laughs> if you cut me, cut me like 0.1% or something. I appreciate that. I don't know. Do like some NFT, like I, I'm seeing now. Who was it like Colin Colin and Samir who mm -hmm. do like creator economy mm -hmm. stuff like what do they do mm -hmm. where yep. everyone like it was mad some mad split share thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't really understand this now. A lot I know I know the technology is gonna change shit, but I don't know the applications in which they're useful yet. Utility, I don't think yeah. like all the fucking digital art bullshit, whatever. I, I really don't understand yeah. that. And I saw people buying tweets and then tweets getting deleted. So I'm just like, okay, well, you're not actually buying the tweet anyway, right. are you, you fuckers? Right, right. Um, so some things make sense to me, some don't. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the complete application of even like Bitcoin, for example, will it be a, a currency in the necessary sense? Or is it going to be like a value store like gold? Right. Or how will it be applied in future? Because if I have Bitcoin, I don't want to be buying the Domino's pizza with it. Right. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? If I have like not point, even if it, it's like point zero 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 one of a Bitcoin, like, right. If that's going to inflate, keep growing like in value, then I'm not not using that shit. So I don't know if it has any like application in that sense. But if it is a value store, then that's sure. that's interesting, right? And then, so I, I yeah, I'm reluctant to try and fully understand the utility mm. of everything. I just want to understand like the ethos behind the technology, yeah. uh, and then that's just going to I think rapidly evolve now. Like as we say, esports rapidly evolves. I think like the actual crypto blockchain thing will rapidly evolve. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully it just evolves to a point where it's real purpose. Yeah. You know, yeah. like, especially like the, the nifties and, and stuff like, uh, like the, the concept of digital ownership, whether it is in the form of like a nifty as we know it now or something else. Sure. Um, I don't know, but like digital ownership in the future, obviously is a huge opportunity and I can't see a world in which it's not right. pivotal. Yeah. It, 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 and I think it's important to like, you know, like right now there's going to be a lot of industries that are affected by it. Um, and I think the application to esports is the most fascinating, but I think it's the least known. Um, you know, there, there's so, but the but instead of like w without getting into, we're just going to generalize it here a little bit. But like, it's not necessarily like the industries that it's impacting and the value that it's creating right now. But it's like it's the underlying technology behind it, like having a smart contract and having visibility, you know, and having like transparency. Like those are the problems, at least from the way I see it, that it solves. You know, um, it, it's it's public. It's transferable, you know, there's royalties you can attach to it. There's, 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 there's three to four to five to 10 year value you can put in that token, but it's up. A lot of it is up to the person who's doing it. So the people who are doing the right thing and thinking about the long term, And again, this goes back to the community, right? Like community is like this huge topic that's coming up and it's really important. And so the people who know how to build a community, I feel like the people who are going to thrive, small example. Not related to esports, but kind of because Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk owns, he's a minority owner in the Minnesota Rocker, you know, um, but he did, he's got, he created his own NFT project that regardless of yes. what initial value that he put in that specific token, that gives what it does, what every token does is give people three years of access to an exclusive conference that only those token holders have. That's valuable, mm -hmm. you know, like that's, you get one-on-one -on -one time with Gary. You get to like go to the things that he only shares about in these conferences. Like you get insider knowledge, you get exclusivity. So, you know, there's, that's to me, one example of a person who's doing it right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just remember, um, the reputation of, um, blockchain yeah. in esports in 2018. Uh, 
I remember there was someone trying to pitch it to me, like I was going to buy some right, right, right. journalist. <laughs> someone was trying to pitch it to me at an ESI event. They were called uh, Intergalactic Gaming. And yeah. I remember they were the subject of plenty of ribbon in like 2019, maybe 2018. Yeah. Um, but they were saying like smart contracts are going to change everything and we're going to build Ethereum and on the blockchain mm. and blah, 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 blah. And like everyone just laughed them off the face of the earth then in esports. Yeah. Like it was not, none of it was taken seriously. Yep. Like it was exclusively seen as a scam, Ponzi scheme, right. pyramid scheme, however, however you want to frame it. But now there's all these people getting into Ethereum and, and, and look, I think like memes are like the somehow like the greatest form of communication and understanding we've got on the internet yeah, right now. Yeah, yeah. So like when is a like when when there's something like Doge comes about some something about the meme nature of it and, and the community nature of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 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 crazy and, and that's where the, the value is right like it's got no value but the value is derived from the fact it's got no value but everyone's believing exactly. it has value because of the meme yeah it's, it's fucking ridiculous yeah. right so so just seeing how esports like within esports because that's the industry i operate within the one i pay the most attention to unfortunately yeah um seeing how they've changed well we're we're changing our collective kind of perspective and point of view on things is interesting but i think it's also just because like that the the utility of it and the usage is changing yep. over time, right? Yeah, it is. Um, so I don't know where it'll be in ten years. Like, I, it's going to impact media, journalism, fucking all of it, isn't it? So I just don't know how, and it scares me a little bit. Sure. Uh, and it makes me reluctant to try and understand everything yeah. right now. But I also do. I'm 26. I feel old as shit <laughs> because every day is just something new now. Yeah, yeah. Where I, I'm just like, what the fuck's this? And is it Safe Moon people are on about now? Yeah, uh, I don't. Uh, I don't. I don't. I don't even know. I don't even know. I think that's the latest thing people are investing in. It's probably a, a crypto of some yeah, sort. Yeah. Um, I, but apparently you need like three apps to be able to like buy into it and all this kind of shit. Yeah. I don't understand. I'm, so I'm just watching from afar. Yeah. Uh, if I had, well, I work in esports journalism. I don't have a lot of money. But if I did, I'd put it in a couple of them. But like a lot of them I'd be staying away from, i put it that way. Yeah. Until I know what the fuck's uh, actually going on. For real, on. yeah. The whole GameStop thing scares me. Yeah. Because the amount of people who got involved because it was a meme, right? Yep. Uh, and they thought, oh, we're going to get shit tons of money out of this and probably took loans out and stuff. Yep. Or, like, put money in that they didn't really have, in a sense, mm-hmm. uh, just to then presumably lose it. Oh, we didn't hear a lot of stories about the, 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 the post-blow-up of games, did we? So, uh, fuck, you know, that, that kind of stuff makes me very reluctant to, to get involved. But it is interesting, and, and it's, to me, it's like I can't even wrap my head around where it's going to go. Yep. Like, you can hypothesize a lot, but, like, it just gets to a point where... I don't have the knowledge of where this could go. Yeah. So like as a, as a limit as like a gate to like the next level for me of like, well, what application could be. And there are people at the forefront of that who I follow, Yeah, but it, it's, I'm not, I'm not there yet. Yeah. Uh, I would love to see how our industry adopts it in like 10, 15 years. I wish I could fast forward and see that well, because it's going to change everything. Surely. I, I think, I think we've already have, we we've shed a small light on, on, on how it will, because like you look at, you look at Activision, I mean, they made, I think it was like 1.2 or 1.4 billion on on weapon skins in Warzone. I mean, so we've already mm-hmm. we've already proven that like it's it's gonna happen. You know what I mean? Like like the, the gamer gamers like already understand the concept of like the digital ownership and like the you know and the idea of like owning a skin, like you know being able to trade skins on a secondary market. You know, like and having yeah CS:GO and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so you uh, and the value is derived by the the amount on there right. and how much the demand is right. Yeah. The highest buyer. Yeah. And, yeah, and how many are point. available? How many were created? How many? You know, so like that's. I think that's mm-hmm. scratching the surface, but I think that's like one example that we kind of currently are in today that we can, like, okay, I can see how this works. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, but I'm sure there's yeah. plenty that both you and I don't even know about. You know what I mean? No doubt about yeah. it. I don't know a lot. Yeah, man. I'll be the first to say that. Yeah, man. I'm clueless on a lot of things. <laughs> well, I think to, to tell you through that, I'm like, it's a great place to be because people who claim that they're experts in this industry, I don't trust them. Like any, anyone who oh, that, that, that's in line, that's in line with my, yeah. my column on that. So, yeah. Anyone, uh, we're on the same, path. anyone who claims that they're like an expert and know exactly what's going to happen, you know, like in who's a guru in a, in a scene that's existed for less than 10 years total. Like if you look at Bitcoin in its entirety, like you fuck right off, you know? Um, but want to, want to start wrapping things up here, man. You know, like, uh, one point I wanted to touch on that I want to ask a question is like, you know, you're. You mentioned you were trying to bring people into this industry. You're trying to help grow it the right way. You're trying to help bring more transparency. 
Um, mm -hmm. what is it it's for someone who wants to be in a position like you or to, to be, uh, like, like to, to choose like this, a similar career path, like kind of like, what would you, yeah. what would you tell them? You know, man, like I have no formal training in journalism, mm -hmm. so I would probably benefit from a little bit of that, but also I benefited a lot from doing and watching. So, uh, like it's always when you want to be like a writer, the, the obvious thing. And everyone says it, but it's so fucking true. That's the thing is like read a lot and then write a lot and then get people, hopefully like whether it's a family member or someone to read your writing. And if it's simple enough where they can understand what the fuck you're on about, then you're on the right path. Right. Mm. So I, I think there's no, there's no shortcut, uh, when it comes to just the graft, like just pumping shit out the reps that you have to put in, like, you're not going to go to the gym once and come out looking like like Sylvester Stallone in like the third, like yeah. when he's 30 or something, you know, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous. So I, I think I view it, I view it that way as, as no replacement for the, the graft it takes to put in a lot of work and, and, and one, so that's on the writing front, but in the actual specific journalism front, I'd identify uh, the, the beat you want to work on, make it as specific as possible at first. So if it's Call of Duty esports, if it's, um, microtransactions, like all these different things, yeah. um, these little areas because I've got a very broad area, even though it's niche, it's very fucking broad because it covers every game in a sense, like any publisher, any company that gets into it. I, I was stupid, <laughs> even though it kind of picked me. Um, so like pick like League of Legends, esports or whatever. And then, and then the most underrated aspect of journalism is, is networking by, by far is being friends with people and, and providing value to them. So when the time comes, they can provide value to you. That's, that's the, the mechanism that it took me a little bit to understand and still I could be a lot better at networking now. Um, I'm trying, but also I have to, look, I have to still write do your as job. well as network yeah. And, yeah. and justify, justify my employ me being employed, yeah. you know, like I don't get, I don't get paid to just sit in zoom calls nor would I want to. So, well, I, I recommend people identify the, the key people in their chosen beat, uh, get into conversations with them, follow them, reply to them on Twitter. Eventually they'll follow you back unless they've already followed you back straight away. Yep. Then congrats. Um, and don't just go into it and say, Hey, have you heard of anything about this? Like, mm -hmm. it's not going to work that way. Like as, as, um, if you read like the, the, the psychology of influence, uh, very, very good book. Um, it talks about like the rule of reciprocity where if, if I see you in the street and I give you five pounds, you're going to want to do something back to me. Even if you don't know me, just like the rule of reciprocity, I owe you. Right. right? So, whether it's like writing an article, like a random shitty news piece that you really don't care about and you don't think your readers will care about, but it provides value to the person who you think could help you out in the future, blah, 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 like something like that, or like putting them in touch with the right person or, or even offering like genuinely to help someone out. Like all these things require a little bit of reciprocity in, re in return in most people's like human psychology. So I'd say networking should be the number one priority and technical writing skill is second. We've got a lot of shit. Well, we've got a lot of decent journalists who are shit writers. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. Like as long as they can string together sentences and the, and the editors can like tie it up <laughs> uh, and, yeah. and you know what I mean? And they can like, they convey the message correctly and protect their sources and make it clear as to what they're talking about. Like that, that's the, the, the main crux of the job, right? So yeah, networking is massively underrated when it comes to, like tips to us journalists for some reason. I don't know why it seems to all be angled on writing. Mm. Um, when it definitely, in my opinion, at least it definitely shouldn't be. But I mean, like on, on my front, I got into writing because I liked movies and television shows. So I set up my own blog and I wrote 1000 articles in, in a year for free, got paid nothing because I enjoyed it. Mm. And then I was looking at like what the official trades are doing, like Hollywood reporter variety, blah, blah, blah. I can learn from them. And I can also look back at myself three months on, and kind of go, oh, that's where I fucked up. Oh, I wouldn't do that now. Right. And you can see the progression, and that keeps you want to. That makes you want to keep going. So I did a thousand articles, uh, like two hundred fifty words at least, probably four hundred, five hundred words. Sometimes features. Uh, managed to interview some people uh, for my own blog, which got to like twelve thousand monthly readers, which was just me running it, working four hours a night, like as alongside my full time job, by the way, not getting paid. Right, 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 you know right. what I mean? Like it was just an interest. Uh, that's how it worked, but I didn't go into it expecting anything. As I say, I fell into this shit, um, entirely, but as no, as far as I'm aware, and I'd love to know if there is, there's no hack that will be, be able to, uh, help you bypass all of the work and all of the mundane 
bullshit. It's not mundane at the time, but you look back and it's mundane. Yeah, 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 yeah. All of that shit. Like, it's, it, there's a lot of like, like work that, that needs to go into it and like forging like meaningful relationships and then working how to maneuver within those efficiently without uh, coming across as like, I don't know, maybe like manipulating someone or like only being friends with them because you want something from them. There's all these different things you need to be able to do and you can only learn, learn those things through experience, yeah. which links back to the beginning where experience sometimes trumps like formal education and knowledge. Right? So it all comes full circle. Yeah. The best podcasters in the world official illustrated by that. Yeah. Yeah. Boom. Awesome, man. <laughs> Pin drop. If that helps. Yeah. No, absolutely, man. Well, Adam, it's been a treat having you on. Uh, if you, you know, for people, appreciate you having me, man. For the people who are, who are listening, who, uh, you who don't know you like where would you want them to go like what uh where do you want them to find you if uh they can go on google and type in adam fitch um mm -hmm. i'll pop up uh at the top because i'm good at seo uh but yeah just go on twitter at, at by adam fitch uh got a fancy blue tick because i am myself yeah. even though they never asked me to actually prove that i am myself <laughs> which i that's find wild. very interesting yeah yeah i just i just woke up like 1 a.m at some point couldn't sleep went on twitter I was like, oh, I'm verified for some reason. Yeah. Okay, they know I'm me. Cool. That's that's the only purpose it says. But yeah, by, at by Adam Fitch on Twitter. Uh, and you can read my work on deserto.com. Awesome, man. Well, hey, again, Adam, it's been a treat having you on. You have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you for having me, mate. Appreciate it. Bye.